Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes as always and today I'm joined by Dr. Rebecca Owens. She is a lecturer in psychology at the University of Sunderland in the UK. Her interests include mating behaviors, preferences and strategies, male psychology and body image slash identity and well-being. And those are the topics we're going to talk about today. So Dr. Owens, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Hi, thank you for having me. Okay, so uh, let's start with mating behavior. So, uh, and because later we're going to talk about male psychology, I guess it's important for us to talk a little bit about sex differences, since you're also an evolutionary psychologist. So, uh, what are some of the most well established sex differences in mating behavior? I'd say that the best established ones are probably in terms of short term mate preferences. Um, we see a lot of similarities um, a, a, between men and women in terms of their long term preferences. But, you know, men tend to be, um, I, I don't know how to say this in a nice way, but have, have lower, a lower threshold, I guess, um, in terms of short term mating behaviours whereas women usually don't. So that's that's probably the, the biggest sex difference we would see and all of the things that come along with that in terms of what men find attractive in short-term in short mating scenarios versus women. Um, obviously women do, um, do have some short-term mate preferences as well, but generally that's the biggest sex difference we would see. Mm -hmm. But both men and women have uh, shorter, uh, um, I mean, short term and long term preferences. I mean, it's not the case that, for example, we, uh, men or is it that men tend to be more short term oriented than women long term? I mean, is there a big sex difference there? Yeah, the, I mean, generally we would see um, men um, more short term men oriented than women, mm -hmm. but um, but there is, you know, there's there's kind of a stereotype, I guess, that that men are only short term mating oriented, and it's it's kind of easy to develop stereotypes around that that women are only long term mating oriented and men are only short term mating oriented. But that's not true, you know. Um, in humans, you know, we we think that there was competition in terms of female competition for the best mates in the ancestral environment as well, because men do a lot of provisioning of offspring. So having a man who was um, investing and in long-term mating oriented was also very beneficial. Likewise, for women, sometimes short-term mating, um, um, short mating scenarios would have been really beneficial as well. So generally, men are more short-term mating oriented, but there's also, they're also not just that way. Yeah. Couldn't these differences have something to do with, uh, I mean, what would be the optimal mating strategies or reproductive strategies for men and women because of the way their reproductive systems work? I mean, for men, it would be optimal for them to try to impregnate as many women as possible. And for women, I mean, perhaps it would be better for them to try to, try to get a, yeah. a committed partner to help them with uh, rearing the children. Definitely, definitely. That that's ultimately where all of these differences stem from, um, in terms of an evolutionary perspective. And obviously, we know that when we come to look at um, behaviour in the real world, it's it's obviously multifaceted and very complex. But when we're only taking that one perspective, that's where all of these differences start from. Sex differences in reproductive biology, and women had to invest more in offspring than men did and it's it's just a fact and, and men would would be able to benefit from from the women's investment in offspring in that sense as well and um, so you, you're absolutely right yeah yeah and isn't it also the case that uh, men tend to be more socio-sexual than women i mean they uh, are more open to and are more interested in having sex with people that are not they are not really emotionally committed to that's right, yeah. So social sexuality, um, you know, if, if any of your listeners aren't aware, is um, an individual differences variable in terms of how um, 
accepting and willing you are to engage in short-term uncommitted sexual relations. So generally we see that women have quite a restricted social sexuality, which is that they require more evidence of investment um, before they'll have sex with a man. And generally we see that men are the opposite, that they're more commit, um, they're more engaged, more willing to engage in short-term or uncommitted sexual relations. Um, so yeah, generally we see that that's, that's the case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we've been talking mostly about mating strategies. What about mate preferences? What are some of the most well-established sex differences there? So in terms of mate preferences, we generally see that um, men well, again, it comes down to short term and long term as well. There's differences there, but you know, in a short term, men men will um, prioritise better looking women, indicators of fertility and youth, um, and women will prioritise indicators of genetic fitness. Um, and quite often, you know, we're, and, and again, we're not talking necessarily about consciously, but quite often, the more sort of dark personality traits are, are seen as attractive in. in um, in, for, for, for both men and women, to be honest. But in long-term mate preferences, we see um, women prioritising things like agreeableness and indicators of being a good father, someone who's not only capable of investing in, in her and their offspring, but someone who's willing to provide that investment as well. So someone who's more, yeah, or, well, we, we generally call them good good father indicators or good partner in, indicators. Um, so that's yeah. So it interacts with the with um, the short and long term mating preferences and um, mating strategy as well. Yeah, and perhaps when it comes to long term relationships, there are also some big similarities, isn't it? The case that both men and women prefer. Uh, I think it's three characteristics. Uh, they prefer partners who are kind, intelligent, yeah. and uh, I can't remember the third one, but isn't yeah. that the case? Yes, that's that's right. Yep. So all of a sudden, you know, when we're looking at short term mate preferences for men, where the threshold is often quite low and um, in the long term mate and, um, context, we see that that threshold increases quite a bit. And yeah, physical attractiveness is less important, but things like being kind and being intelligent is something that is prioritized more in that in that scenario. And it's the same for women as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but within each sex, I mean, what are the sort of mate preferences that men and women have when it comes to short term versus long term relationships? So for women, women tend to, um, I mean, just, just let us know if I'm not answering your question here, but women tend to um, find things like indicators of muscularity very attractive in men in a short-term scenario or at the, or at the early stages of a relationship at least, you know, things that are physically attractive or um, att things that indicate um, attractiveness in a short time frame. Um, so indicators of muscularity, um, indicators of competitiveness, indicators of dominance, um, things like um, where they rank in the social hierarchy and things like that, indicators of financial resources um, and things like that as well. So we see we see that kind of variation in female mating preferences and those kinds of things sort of decrease as, as the, the relationship develops over a long term, um, if, it, if it develops over a long term thing. So it's that threshold that sort of dips and changes, I guess, as, as the relationship develops, as, as you ch change and develop what you need and what you prioritize from a relationship at this point in time differs from this point in time. And so we see that those indicators kind of change in that way. Does, does that answer your question or am I just... Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, but, but what about males? I mean, are there any big differences when it comes to the kind of mate preferences they have for short term versus long term relationships? So the main ones were the ones that you covered before, really, and I think the, probably one of the most important ones was intelligence. I think that's the one that comes out quite quite a bit in the literature. But again, like you, like you mentioned, kindness. So it's more that the threshold increases for, for willingness to engage. Um, so the, the threshold for engaging in a, in a relationship or, or in a sexual relationship anyway is quite low in a short term context but then this this does increase and if they're going to invest in somebody then this woman needs to 
be more than just physically attractive, more than just young. Um, so we tend to see, again, indicators of intelligence, um, indicators of kindness, indicators of agreeableness um, and independence as well. Um, to to be whether those things don't matter so much in short term contexts, generally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So talking now about male psychology, yes. I mean, perhaps going to the, ver the very foundations of it, uh, when we talk about uh, male psychology and male behavior, testosterone comes to mind very quickly. Yes. So what are the kinds of effects that testosterone has on male psychology and male development? So generally, um, testosterone levels serve to increase um, I guess increased motivation uh, to um, socially dominate and that's something that's been adaptive throughout our evolutionary history it's just that the environment was real different you know so we look back at our ancestors and social dominance probably would have only been achieved through various physical means whether that was hunting or fighting or what um but now our environment's so different and we can see that there's more chances, more ways that people can show dominance. And obviously it's not just men that can show dominance right now as well, but testosterone for sure definitely um, rises and falls to help, to help facilitate that. Um, and we think, you know, that the, that the ultimate um, function of that is to demonstrate your capacity as a mate, demonstrate your capacity as a rival, as well and ultimately increase reproductive success so we see testosterone sort of increases competitiveness it can increase aggression in, in some circumstances and um, it can also increase how attractive men are perceived as well as well as increasing things like muscularity it's responsible for you know the deepening of the vocal cords and, and things like that um, yeah and I mean, even during fetal development, it has a very important role to play, right? Absolutely. For example, it's one of the hormones that plays a big role in terms of uh, the, the sexual differentiation of the brain. And in yes. the case of males, it plays a big role there. Right? It does, it does, yes. Um, so, you know, through, throughout gestation, um, I, I, think, I think it's very early on, you get like a, a real big increase in testosterone, usually for... for um, male babies i mean obviously female babies are exposed to it as well but it does have different um it has an important organizational effect on the brain for sure yeah and we know that in later life you know at different points in, in life puberty probably being the most obvious one um we see these activational effects where testosterone will increase again and it activates those organizational differences that were sort of set in place during really early gestational development. Yeah. Can we say that testosterone causes aggression? I mean, can we establish a causal relationship there? Because I've read some literature that points to the fact that, I mean, the, the sort of behavioral effects testosterone has depends also on the social context. It's more that it, it drives behaviors that are associated with uh, status, I mean, the kinds of behaviors that increases male status, then, then, prop, uh, then aggression itself. I yeah. mean, it depends on the social context. That's, that's it, exactly. So it's, it's a real common, um, again, maybe a stereotype um, that, that we see that, you know, this association between testosterone and aggression. And I think, uh, I think a lot of the reason for that is because a lot of our research has come from non-human animals. Um, so if you're doing, you know, if you're giving testosterone injections to say rats or something, there's only one way that they can really increase their dominance. So we we go, oh look, testosterone caused this aggressive behaviour, and we're like, well, yeah, but it's not it's not as simple as that in humans. So we can see, you know, there's evidence that suggests that testosterone increases cooperation. Um, when the cir when the circumstances are right, when the circumstances call for cooperation, men will competitively cooperate as such so we see um we see testosterone kind of driving this competition in a lot of different ways and i think we think of competition generally as something quite aggressive because we think of it as a zero sums game we think of a competition as well if i'm the winner that means you have to be the loser so my success is always to the detriment of you 
Um, but it's, I guess, in, in our environment now, we're not, it, it's not as simple as that. Um, so even though we have these very, very primitive motivations, it doesn't necessarily transpire that way, um, thankfully. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure if this is the correct interpretation, but I mean, since testosterone plays a big role in male behavior and in that way, I mean, in terms of mate value being high status is very important for men, then I mean, testosterone would mediate the sorts of behaviors that in each specific social context would increase a particular male's uh, social status and thus their mate value. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's uh, uh, the correct interpretation of it. Yeah, um, you know, testosterone fluctuating levels of testosterone are very responsive to the environment, and you can see that um, you know there's various literature that shows you know you present a stimulus, whether that's you know you can show show men porn videos or you can introduce them to an attractive confederate or um, put them in a competitive scenario, and you can see that it has. Um, the desired effects on their testosterone level and you know there's some research that showed testosterone increases as we would think of um, as we see across various forms of competitive scenarios even in things like chess that you wouldn't necessarily think of as something as aggressive or physically dominant but it, it, it's, it happens and it, we see differences when we introduce women into those scenarios as well um, so it's very, it's very um, responsive to the to the stimuli of the environment as well, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, are there really big sex differences in aggression? I mean, are men more aggressive than women on average? Actually, not. Um, so again, I think another another um, common sort of stereotype or misunderstanding um, that I think has come from from a long time, really. Um, this idea of men being aggressive, men being physically violent, domineering, um, because that is part of the, the male stereotype or the male gender role in some ways to be domineering. To, there's, I guess there's a, there's a cut off, isn't there, between being dominant and domineering. Um, but all the evidence suggests that women can be just as aggressive as men. Um, so lots of men aren't very aggressive, lots of women are very aggressive. Um, it's less often, I believe, this might not be correct, but it's less often physically um, aggressive. Women, women are less often phys physically aggressive, but women um, perpetuate an awful lot of domestic violence, for example, um, particularly around coercive control. So, um, th you know, for example, you know, over lockdown, there was a lot of awareness that was happening around female victims of domestic violence who were now being taught to stay at home with their abusers and you would see all the pictures and the adverts around this and around awareness of it and just not not to say that that was wrong or anything but just um overlooks all of the men who were in that situation as well because there's this kind of perception in in society i think that you know women are smaller women are milder women are meeker women aren't as strong as men and therefore if men were ever on that end of a woman attacking him or something he would very easily be able to, to stop her and that's just not always the case um so yeah the, there's a lot of sorry i took that off on, on a right on a tangent <laughs> um but yeah it's not it, no so it's sex di sex differences or there's, there's more sex similarities in perpetration of things like domestic violence for sure yeah, and talking about domestic violence, isn't it unfortunate that we tend to see it as a sort of gendered issue that females are the victims and males are the perpetrators? Because, I mean, there's also lots of female to male uh, domestic violence, right? Definitely, definitely. And, you know, I think it's great that there's a lot of support for women of, um, victims of domestic violence and intimate partner violence and things like that. I just wish that there was comparable levels of support for male victims and comparable um, awareness of those issues as well. I think, you know, over our our recent history, you know, I don't know, maybe the last 50 years or something like that, there's been so much awareness for female victims um, and so much more support and methods of, of helping and reaching out to that, um, you know, very hard to reach sample in some cases. 
Um, and I think we've just got a long way to go still before we can bring that up to being comparable for male victims. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also because of the fact perhaps that it's uh, at least to some extent harder for males to present themselves as victims of Absolutely. domestic violence because it, it makes them seem weak and that's something that really, I mean, strikes a chord in men because they have evolved for to not present themselves as weak because they are not as sexually uh, desirable if, if they do that and uh, I mean it affects them psychologically. I think so yeah I think I think that's a really good point I think um, even though you know we can say it we can say to people don't worry about that it, it's fine and people often know that logically but it doesn't make it any easier emotionally to accept it and it's that again it comes back to this basic sort of very innate motivation to want to be strong and i'm a man and this is you know i need to show that i am tough and um strong and one i would never be a victim but also i would never attack a woman and and so all of these things sort of yeah cause a very complex interplay i think yeah yeah. So going back to testosterone, mm -hmm. is there any relationship between levels of testosterone and male well-being? There is some research about that, actually. Um, and a lot of it shows that as, um, you know, in, as men approach sort of middle age and their testosterone levels start to decrease, it can have a knock-on effect in terms of depression. Um, and sometimes testosterone will decrease too far. And um, we see, you know, men can be treated with testosterone supplements to help to help counteract that. But th we do think that there's a, a relationship there. Yeah. So there's a correlation between low levels of testosterone and depression. Is there? Yeah. A... Yeah. Um, and particularly once it gets too low. Um, so there's is it hypogonadism um, when when testosterone levels can get too low, like below the baseline that we would expect. So there's, you know, you, you know, we would expect to see some normal amounts of variation between this and this. But once it gets down here, then we've got a problem. It's below the threshold, and we see that that has a, a negative impact on well-being. Mm -hmm. And how do romantic relationships influence levels of testosterone in males? Yes, there is a lot of evidence around that. Um, so, and again, it comes back to what I what I'd mentioned before about um, testosterone. You know, support and kind of the acquisition of resources, dominance, um, mating opportunities in an ancestral environment. So, what we tend to see is that single men have quite high levels of testosterone. And um, that, that um, I guess you you see in a lot of other mammals um, and and birds, um, testosterone levels to help support the acquisition of, of relevant reproductive resources and once they get partnered or once they commit to a partner their testosterone levels decrease and once they start having children it decreases even further as well and it, it it's it symbolizes the i guess i guess that they're out of the mating game at that point that they're, they're sort of retiring from the competitiveness and the need to dominate and that they're just sort of focusing on um, investing in, in their partner and in their offspring and maintaining the resources that they have rather than acquiring new resources, yeah. Mm -hmm. So is, would that explain why young males, young single males are the ones that tend to be more risk-taking and violent? Yes, yes, exactly. Um, so, you know, you might, you've probably heard this before, um, being called, you know, I think, 18 to 25 year olds being the youngest and um, the riskiest demographic 18 to 25 year old males and um, so the young male syndrome by Wilson and Daly I think it was that that suggested that um, so yeah you tend to see because men have this hardwired inclination to to dominate um, and acquire resources they're gonna start you know there's gonna be more men than women taking risks in a certain domain and it, it comes into this this idea of um, the male variability hypothesis. I don't know if you've heard of that before. Um, and the idea of it is is that there's just generally more variability in men in whatever um, whatever thing it might be that we're looking at, whether it's risk taking or um, measures of intelligence and IQ. Then the the mean might often be the same. 
but there's more variation in men and so we tend to see more of the men at the very bottom of the distribution than at the very top of the distribution whereas women just tend to cluster more around the mean um so when you just look at the means it looks the same but it's the variation that's different and i think that's that's why we can explain why more men will take very extreme risks it might explain why we see more men you know at the top of various um, corporations and things like that more men who have dark personalities likewise we tend to see more men at the bottom of those distributions more men who don't have mating opportunities who don't have partners who don't have jobs so we see a lot more men who are homeless we see more men who um, take them take their lives by suicide you know um, so the, the variation is, is really wide across a lot of a lot of different areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when it comes to issues of social justice, maybe that's another thing that we have to take into account. I mean, there yeah. are more males that are, for example, talking about IQ that are geniuses, more males than females, but there yeah. are also more uh, low IQ autistic males, for example, and that really has a very, very high impact on people's life prospects yeah definitely definitely yeah mm -hmm. yeah okay so uh, but uh, let's say that males start a romantic relationship is it that their mating strategies change as the romantic relationship goes on yes um so as the relationship develops there's physiological psychological changes and whether that suggests that they want to invest in a relationship or whether they do not want to invest in a relationship we see those kind of um physiological psychological hormonal changes even to facilitate that strategy yeah mm -hmm. so uh, i mean i mean but but are there specific i don't know could we could we talk about perhaps stages across the development of a romantic relationship and perhaps uh, uh, the uh, a mixed bag of mating strategies that vary across that development or or not yeah i mean i think i think um how how this sort of plays out in practicality is you know we've got it again it's all very multifaceted and it'll be different across different environments and things like that but if we if we try and strip it back and look look at it at, at the base kind of level and just look at that kind of factor we did some research it was it was during my phd with with my supervisor um, and we found that men who were in we classified it as a new relationship of up to a year they still had testosterone levels that were comparable to single men and it was only after that one year period when testosterone levels start to decrease and that wasn't in in men who had children or anything like that so this was just either in you know partnered non-fathers who were either um, with with their partner for less than a year or more than a year and single non-fathers as well so we and and that wasn't a correlation so there was no linear relationship there it just seemed to kind of all of a sudden drop off after that year and we sort of interpreted that as a possible hedging the bets almost I know that probably sounds really awful um, <laughs> but um, yeah that, that it was after after that initial period of, of a year something something kind of flips and it's like time to invest or time to get out mm -hmm. um, and we see testosterone sort of go to in a way that supports that mm -hmm. and does marriage itself has any sort of influence on male mating strategies and levels of testosterone for example because i would imagine that marriage really uh, scales up uh, scales up things in terms of level of commitment yes I, th I think so as well um and it can be hard i mean a lot of the a lot of the slightly older literature did look at um marriage as this indicator where you know whether it was single or married men um, and didn't really consider married men um unmarried men who were in a long-term committed relationship so it kind of muddied the waters in some in some way um but then obviously as time goes on and people are less inclined i guess to get married as as soon as they did perhaps i don't know 50 years ago or something um 
So we tend to see people who are more often in these long-term committed relationships without, you know, the stamp of marriage, I guess. Um, but I, I think generally, yes, I think the idea of being married would have a really big psychological impact on somebody because that not only is this kind of cultural sanction, but there's also a lot of legalities behind that as well and things, you know, in terms of your financial situation and everything. Um, so I think I think it, it would have a bigger impact on, on men's psychology than just being in a long-term committed relationship. Mm -hmm. What about when men have children? Does that also influence their mating strategies in any way? Yes, um, testosterone decreases again. Um, more so than when they were just in a relationship, in a committed relationship. Um, and there is some evidence that suggests that the more hands-on, the more investing that men are with their children, you know, so the more um, involved they are in di direct um, care and provisioning of their children, the lower it is, again. Um, and the idea is that it, it's kind of a protective mechanism, again, to remove them from sort of aggressive um, scenarios, competitive scenarios where they could be in danger, again, thinking about the ancestral environment, um, and to encourage them to invest and to be softer and more gentle and things like that. So that, yeah, yeah. Do we find similar changes in terms of mating strategies and perhaps mate preferences for women uh, across a romantic relationship? Um, so I found this really interesting and, and I published a paper on this last year um, because I've, there's a lot of research that looks at how men's mating strategies change over the development of a relationship in terms of you know testosterone and competition and dominance and things like that. But there wasn't anything that looked at how women's, not that I know of anyway, is how women's um, mating strategies change over the development of a single relationship. So people would look at their short-term mate preferences or their, their long-term mate preferences in isolation, and that makes sense. But it would never, it was never how it developed in the one relationship. So in the paper that I did, um, we did find evidence that women's mate preferences change, and they, as as the the relationship develops, they, you know, these indicators of sort of good parenting, um, being investing being kind, supportive, agreeable, being a good partner and a good father, um, those preferences increase as you would probably expect rather than from something at the beginning of a relationship where it just doesn't even come into your mind. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if what I'm about to say makes any sense or, or not, but since we have the phenomenon of paternity and certainty, couldn't it be that that could lead to some sex differences in terms of how mates, mating strategies change for men and women in a committed relationship. Because, I mean, for the woman, she is 100% sure that that kid is hers. But for the male, I mean, not really. So Definitely, definitely. I think that's got a huge impact. And I know... Um, I know a lot of people will say, but that's not relevant to us anymore. We, we can test, you know, DNA and um, things. But it doesn't mean that we don't still have those innate motivations there. We've sort of engineered a solution in, in, our, in our society now, and that's great. Um, but we still have these very primitive motivations. And, yeah, we've, we see women... women are 100% sure that that child that she's internally gestating is hers, whereas a man never will never fully know, um, not without testing anyway, but the motivation is still is still there, but he will never fully know. So the more uncertain he is, the less likely he is to invest um, because there's a risk then that he could be investing in offspring that's not his, and that means that ultimately he'd be increasing the reproductive success of somebody else rather than his own. So he's going to be more likely to, you know, there's, there's things around like jealousy and mate garden behaviours to help increase the likelihood of, um, if, well, of paternity certainly, essentially. So that's one idea around um, jealousy and mate garden behaviours. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
And there's perhaps also another question here. So, I mean, we have this evolved psychology in terms of for males and females, the sort of mate preferences they have, the mating strategies they pursue. But I mean, with these kinds of new technologies, like, for example, we can have DNA testing to know for sure that a particular uh, man is the father of that particular okay. child and for women we have recent great de uh, technological developments like the pill for example but yeah. to what e to what extent do these new technologies are really that influential in terms of how they change people's mating behaviors right because they are really really very recent from an evolutionary yeah. perspective they are. I think that's a really good and really interesting question. And it's um, because, like you say, we, you know, we don't have the time to um, evolve physically to respond to those changes. They are so, so very modern and they have had so much of an impact on our development already that I don't think people even realized at the time, um, you know, when the pill was first being developed and things like that. The, the extent that that could influence your mating psychology, your mating behaviours and, and things like that. Um, so in terms of, you know, I, I think of it in terms of um, we've got, you know, our, our very main primitive kind of impulses and sometimes they're not very um, in tune, I guess, with our logical, rational part of our brain. Um, and, it, you know, even things like, for example, surrogacy, um, so a woman might gestate someone else's child for them and she she may well still feel like that that is her baby that she's grown and that's had primitive urges even though logically she knows that that's not hers but it kind of hijacks these very old primitive sort of neural pathways that we've got um, so I think it's really difficult to sort of marry those two things up even though sometimes you know logically that you know this shouldn't bother me that this is someone else's child and I know that but there's this huge part that's really um it feels like your own um I'm not speaking from from first-hand experience there it's just, it's just um just an example but um I think yeah I think I think we've engineered so many potential solutions to adaptive problems but they also bring up new potential problems like that um and I think it's something that is really, it's really difficult for us to ever really kind of um, answer because it's like you say, you, you know logically one thing, but sometimes it just, it just doesn't feel, you can't fully feel that logical thought, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, uh, and in terms of competitiveness, are there big sex differences in terms of how males and females compete in, in humans, of course? Um, generally, yes. Um, so generally, men are much more competitive. And again, it comes back to this male variability that we talked about. And that doesn't mean to say that women aren't competitive and that they're not very good as well. It's just that there's probably, you know, if you sampled the top, I don't know, 5% of athletes in the world, there's probably more men in there than there are women. Um, likewise, at the bottom of the scale. But generally, there, there are differences yes in that sense mm -hmm. but but i i mean it's differences in terms of levels of competition or the way men and women compete among themselves i'm not i'm not entirely sure to be honest because i think um i was even going to mention about like team sports and things because you know, you could you could look at individual versus team sport, and the way we talk about men being very sort of competitive, but they're also so so very cooperative when working in a team that it becomes almost an extension of themselves. This the team is is an extension of themselves. Um, I don't know enough about female competitiveness to be honest to be able to even to be able to comment on that. Thinking about differences in their tactics or their approaches. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, maybe they just compete differently. I mean, yeah. perhaps, perhaps males are more uh, physically aggressive toward one another and females yeah. are more uh, aggressive, but in an indirect way, like, for example, through yeah. gossip and stuff Oh, like oh that. yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, that's something that we definitely see that women 
and and it comes down to sort of risk aversion as well and that's i think that's something that really drives a difference in competitiveness generally um, that men are generally more likely to to take that risk you know if something's looking a bit uncertain men are more likely to take that jump whereas women are more likely to play it safe and this kind of direct versus indirect aggression so you know direct being physical versus indirect being gossiping and things and um, women would be much more inclined to take that route because it removes them from from the path of um, physical harm essentially and um, so we do definitely see see differences in that and and um, you know sp spreading rumors and things like that whereas men you'll see more likely to just hash it out women less so <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, okay so uh, another very prominent theory in evolutionary psychology and evolutionary biology more general uh, life history theory so yeah. are there any principles from there that we can apply to understand better male competitiveness I think so, yeah. I mean, I, I really like life history theory. It, it contextualizes it an awful lot for me. Um, so if, if you think of anything, you know, any life form or any, I mean, I, I feel like this about work even, you know, if you've only got, you've only got a finite amount of energy to input into anything. And when we're talking about your lifetime, you, you've got to put it in a reproductive components that's going to help enhance your reproductive success but that you know it's all about these balances and it's all about these trade-offs in terms of surviving long enough to be sexually active and um, how long until you have children and um, how much investment do you provide in children versus um, trying to secure other mates so trying to kind of adaptively allocate this energy into these fitness enhancing components in an appropriate way in an environment that um, shifts somewhat I guess um, is something that's really challenging but it can be really informative in terms of looking at mating strategies and things so one one of the key distinctions that we talk about is a fast versus low life is slow sorry life history strategy and um, and that's a very you know they are very umbrella terms and we know that in a practical sense nobody ever is just a fast life history strategist or just a slow life history strategist there's different um, contexts for those those strategies but we generally talk about men following faster life history strategies than women and again it comes down to sex differences in reproductive biology women have to be a bit slower in in that sense because they are investing more heavily in offspring so there's no sense in kind of going out and trying to secure more mating opportunities because once she's pregnant she can't get pregnant again um, not for a a few months anyway whereas a man in that time could technically have an awful lot of children if if he if he was following this faster life history strategy um and it, again it's not as black and white as that but it's it's a it's a really interesting framework i think for helping to contextualize it right so we've been talking a lot about sex differences mm -hmm. focusing mostly on male psychology so do gender roles have any important uh, psychological impact in terms of well-being and mental health? I think so, yeah. Um, you know, the, this whole idea about what people should be or what people shouldn't be. And I think sex roles and gender roles are something that's it can be considered really contentious, I guess. Um, I think generally the idea of gender roles have originated from sex differences you know in our evolutionary past and they've come be, they've come to be sort of equated with these constructed gender roles that are perhaps out of date now um, and not necessarily as fixed as people in the past would have maybe been um, so we see more fluidity in gender roles and um, i think the key the key thing really is when you try and impose a stereotype on someone or an expectation on someone of this is how they should behave and that's inconsistent with how they feel within themselves, it's going to have a negative impact on their well-being, um, regardless of whether that's a gender role or whether it's, you know, any other, any other kind of stereotype or expectation of somebody. Um, yeah. But uh, but when it comes to gender role, I mean, it's, uh, gender roles, it's a very complicated question, right? Because I, I mean, 
I, I, I'm not sure if we could say that all of them or most of them, but at least a good part of them also stem from these evolved psychology and these yeah. evolved sex differences. So, I mean, what we expect from men and women is, uh, at least in part, stems from the way our psychology evolved, right? Definitely, definitely. It, it definitely, part of it does stem, um, stem from our, our, you know, sex differences in like our adaptive reproductive strategies and they're at, they're at a very innate and primitive place within us and it's it's these other parts of it that have become sort of gender and um, become sort of constructed i think in society and those are the bits that will change across each different society whereas the more sort of the ultimate kind of perspective i guess on those differences will remain across different societies and across different historical periods of time, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but when it comes to perhaps fighting back against some of the more pernicious effects of these strict gender roles that societies tend to have, I mean, shouldn't we also take into account perhaps also these sex differences in our psychology because i would imagine that for example to understand male and female well-being we have also to understand how males and females tend to think and mm -hmm. behave and uh, and i mean what makes them feel good and bad about themselves right? yeah definitely i mean i think having having that awareness of sex differences in terms of general you know predispositions motivations things like that only helps to to serve to understand different people you know so if we were talking about this in say um a counseling or a therapeutic kind of context and you had a client that came in um and you've got this awareness of typical you know male psychology versus female psychology and similarities and differences it it helps you to scope out and understand your client and they may have um you know they may identify very strongly with a male gender role or a female gender role and and, and that will be really helpful for how you approach that therapy but only if you've got that awareness of if of, of, of sex differences i think whereas you know a lot of people who try and ignore sex differences and pretend that they don't exist and that everybody's the same it's not going to help anybody in that sense Mm -hmm. Right. So still talking about gender roles nowadays, people are talking a lot about concepts like toxic masculinity. Do you think that that's a useful concept both from an evolutionary perspective and also to try to understand male behavior and to try to perhaps fight back against some of the more negative aspects of male psychology? I, honestly, I, I hate the term, and I think it's really, um, I think it's really unfair, and I think it's just really unhelpful. Some people are toxic. Um, some people can behave in toxic ways, um, and I think, I don't know, maybe that's where the term originated. I don't know, but um, just the fact that the term toxic masculinity is becoming so such a well-known concept. I think the impact that that has on on young men growing up, young boys, um, you know, they, they're incorporating into, into their identity that there's a core part of them that is toxic, that they've got to keep in check, that they have to check their friends, that, that all the males in their lives to make sure they're not being toxic, and they've got to speak out um, and and stand up for what's right and things like that it, i just think it's really an unhelpful term i mean everybody should hold each other more accountable i think in terms of toxic behavior when you see it but to conflate that with masculinity i just think is so unhelpful and really damaging to be honest we know there's a lot of toxic behaviors and a lot of toxic traits and to say that it's masculinity just it's just inaccurate Thing. Yeah, and I don't know if you agree with me, but even the more negative aspects of male psychology, I mean, it doesn't seem to me that 
they are always all the time negative. I mean, even things like violence, competitiveness uh -huh. and things like that. I mean, there are specific contexts where they might play a positive and important role. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that's why that's why those things have evolved as well. Um, like an inclination towards some of those kinds of behaviors. Um, not to say that they are appropriate in, in modern society or anything like that. But we, we can trace it back to an evolutionary route. And again, coming back to the male variability, you, you're more likely to see men with, with those kinds of behavioral tendencies and those dark kind of traits than women. Um, but it also means you're going to see more men on the opposite end of that scale than, than women as well. Um, I think one of the, the most um, damaging sort of misconceptions around that is the idea that most men are like that that most men are just, you know, innately a sexual predator, violent, um, abusive, and that's not true at all. Um, it's the minority of men who who behave like that, um, just like a minority of women do. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very important point to make because, uh, I mean, even when it comes, for example, to criminal behavior, it's only a minority of men that commit most of the crimes. So the, the vast majority of males and people in general are not, uh, are very, I, I mean, they are not violent at all or very exactly. little violent. So. Exactly. And there's there's so many positive aspects of masculinity that we would consider, you know, if we were talking about a male gender role, for example, and, and you know, some people will offer these kind of toxic traits as part of a masculine gender role. There's so many positive ones that people just overlook, you know, being being brave, being heroic, um, looking out for, for others and at the expense of themselves, you know, and people don't see that. And then when it does happen, no one no one says, look how cool this guy is, you know what I mean? Um, because it doesn't sort of fit with what's, I guess, dominant in, in society at the minute, what, what's, what's being spoken about, so, yeah. Yeah, okay, so let's now talk about body modification. So why do people modify their bodies? What are the sorts of motivations behind it? Well, again, there's an awful lot. And so as an evolutionary psychologist, my main interest in that is in terms of um, ultimate perspectives and how it increases, you know, perceptions of dominance, attractiveness and things. So you see different um, different modifications in different cultures across the world where they've been used to enhance femininity. Whereas if you brought them over here and people started doing it, we wouldn't necessarily think it's really attractive. So you see differences, um, cross-cultural differences like that. In Western society, you know, there's not been a great deal of psychology research done on it. Um, and so with it being so, I mean, it's not new, but it's definitely got more popular and more common to see, I think, um, it, over the last maybe 20 years or so, um, seeing tattoos and things like that, for example. Um, but a lot of people do it as a kind of expression of, of themselves or as a like a, a memorial thing, a reclamation of, of, of themselves, taking ownership of like a sort of corporeal self, um, things like that. So it can be quite multifaceted. Some people will just do it, you know, for fashion purposes in terms of um, fitting in with the, gra the crowd, what's more um, societally acceptable and, and stuff like that. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't know if this is right, but it seems to me that in more traditional, small-scale hunter-gatherer societies, I mean, we see lots of different kinds of body modifications, and it's not only socially acceptable to do it, but people are even expected to do it, at least to yeah. some extent, because, I mean, there's the, those things about some body modifications being associated with femininity, others with masculinity, and, I mean, they are symbolic, they represent their people, and so on and so forth. So, I, I mean, and, and it's interesting to me because it seems that in more modern industrialized societies, there's more, it seems to me that there's more stigma against some kinds of body modifications yeah. that you wouldn't find in more traditional societies. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, um, I think a good example of that is probably facial tattooing 
it's still really heavily stigmatized in, in contemporary Western societies. Um, but in, in some cultures, it's, it's, it's an integral part of growing up. Um, it's, it's such an integral part of someone's cultural identity that they're going to have these markings put on their face. As, as, and, and to not do that is, is insulting to their kind of their cultural identity and their cultural heritage. Um, so I think, I think that's a, an appropriate example of that. Mm -hmm. But uh, particularly in modern industrialized societies, what are the sorts of ideas that people have about the ones that modify their body in different ways? I mean, is there, I, I mentioned stigma, but is there lots of stigma about it or not? Yeah, there is still a lot, a lot of stigma. And I think um, one of the biggest things is, is the idea that people who get tattoos um, are risk takers. Um, this some of the, some of the stuff that um, in psychology uh, it's, it's, it's still some of my favourite really um, about tattooed women being um, unattractive, heavy drinkers, more promiscuous, and things like that. Um, and I'm not entirely sure where the stereotypes came from originally because I've, I've spoken to a, an, an art historian before, and he's like, you know, it used to be the case that. Um, the upper class ladies all had tattoos. It was just that they weren't necessarily very visible um, because of the fashion at the time. So where those stereotypes came from, I don't know, but they are still they are still quite stigmatized a lot. And there is some evidence to suggest that that's shifting in, um, in industry anyway, like from an employability perspective. Um, it's not necessarily just a case of, oh, you've got tattoos on your hands, you'll never get a job anymore. Um, there is some some increase in acceptability around that, but generally it's still it's still a case of being a risk taker, and not being very clever, um, and things like that. Really, sort of a pervasive sort of stereotype. Yeah, and when we talk about modi body modifications, I, I mean it includes a vast array of things. It's yeah. not only tattoos, for example, but also all sorts of. Uh, aesthetic surgery and things definitely. like that, right? Definitely, yeah. Um, so the the one that I've focused on the most is um, tattooing, because other forms of, of of body modification, you know, more extreme forms of body modification, there's just been no literature done on that. But cosmetic surgery, for sure. Um, and I think I think the motivations. I don't know because I haven't actually looked in, into the literature. I don't know whether the motivations are very similar or very different because I can imagine both of those. I can imagine that one of it, you know, in terms of cosmetic surgery, it, you know, enhancing attractiveness and um, wanting to kind of fit in with the crowd more, you know, or this is a socially acceptable body, sh body shape, body type. And therefore, I want to have that, you know, the, the increase in um, the availability of things like lip fillers and um, toxins, muscle toxins and things like that. Um, it's become more accessible and that all sort of helps chasing, for women anyway, youth, indicators of youth and things like that, which ultimately increase attractiveness and things. So I'm not sure, because with tattooing, there's a lot around need for uniqueness rather than conformity or social acceptability and um, so yeah uh, but do we know why we have such a vast array of body modifications why they vary so much for example in form quality quantity and um, no to be honest and that is something again that i'm i'm really interested in Um, you know tattoo i'm just using tattooing as an example but tattooing um it's come on so so much in recent years. You know the the quality of the inks, the the, the cleanliness of the studios, and you know in, in our in our society anyway. Um, even removal techniques, you know, and the artwork is just amazing. It's it's incredible. Um, so the you know how advanced that is now, and you, obviously you do see a lot of variability. Um, in the quality and in the, the quantity and the coverage and things like that um, and I am really not sure about why or and that, no, I don't know. 
Mm-hmm. Well, I usually don't ask personal questions, but since we don't have uh, still lots of research on these aspects, could you tell us why, for example, what were, were the kinds of motivations behind you doing your tattoos and other body modifications you might have? Um, I mean, to be honest, I think when I was younger, it was probably more about um, um, being a rebel. I think when I was when I was younger, when I got my first one, um, you know, the, nobody had them, and it was really difficult to sort of get them. There weren't many tattoo shops, um, and I told I told my mum that I was going to get one, and she didn't believe us, and um, so I did it. And then I think it's probably became such an ingrained part of my identity that I'll, I'll never really be able to stop and I think you know my preferences about um you know what what tattoos I visually like the look of look of the aesthetics that's changed and developed over time and I used to really like the old school sort of ones with the very thick lines very vivid colors um quite cartoony looking and, and I still love that but less so on me and um I thought I would never get like a lot of black work but but then I did um so and so I think it's it, the motivation sort of change as I do really um I think one of the main differences probably just for some people where they think but this is permanent you you can never re you can never undo this you can never change what if you change your mind what if you don't like it um and I I don't have that concern because even even the tattoos that I have had that I don't have anymore, I always liked for a, for some reason. Um, they were, it was like endearing when there was like little mistakes or something like that. It was quite endearing. So, um, but yeah, I don't have them anymore. So it's not it's not as permanent as some people think, I guess. Yeah, but but I, I mean the sorts of tattoos you make, for example, why do you why do you choose them particularly? Is it because they are aesthetically pleasing for you? Because yeah. they are symbolic of anything? Just or? just aesthetically pleasing for me. I mean, I never I never have any plans for it really. Um, and my best friend, he he has his whole body planned out and mapped out. I don't know how he does it, but for me, I just I'll see something and I'm like. I love it and I need it um, and, and it's as simple that's why nothing matches <laughs> <laughs> okay so uh, let me just ask you perhaps one last question is there any relationship between people modifying their body and their individual well-being their mental well-being um, there and there is some research that suggests that um, modifying your body increases your well-being um so and there's some research that suggests that people with poorer well-being are the ones who are more likely to modify their bodies um so again i only look at this i only know this from tattoo inside so not not so much cosmetic surgery but there is evidence that suggests that people feel better once they've gotten their tattoos they feel more body confident and and less anxious Mm-hmm. But uh, does this have something to do with perhaps the kind of body image they have of themselves that perhaps they feel the need to modify their body in certain ways to be more in line with what they would prefer, perhaps? Quite possibly, quite possibly. Um, and I, th- I think probably more so for cosmetic surgery, cosmetic enhancements, um, you know, following following the, the sort of... Um, acceptable body shapes, whatever fashions coming and going at the time. I think that's probably, um, probably it, yeah. Okay, great. So, Dr. Owens, just before we go, where can people find you on the internet? Um, you can find me on Twitter, which is at Dr. Becky Owens. Um, Instagram's the same, um, and my university staff page as well. Okay, great. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, you for too. coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Hi guys, thank you for watching the interview until the end. Please do not forget to support the show. It's thanks to people like you that it keeps running. So you have links in the description box to Patreon and PayPal. For even just $1 per month, you can support the show and get access to all the goodies I have to for you in Patreon. 
uh, and you also have links to PayPal, of course. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share the interview, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzken, Blanchett Perlager Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, and Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Erika Lenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly. Jerry Mueller, Herbert Kintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Sandruban, Simon Colombo, Jorge Spinha, Phil Cavan, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omri Hickson, Fergal Kusson, Evan Bodrink, Wal Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslan Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, JW, João Weyre, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Desaraujo, Eden Solon, Roman Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Miran B, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Max Bailby, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Elman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, my producer, Zizar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Stefiniak, Ian Gilligan, Sérgio Quadriano, Luis Caetano, Tom Van Egnam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardas France, and Nirvan Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, and Matthew Lavender. Thank you for all.